Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Um, even though lovely is a bit relative, <laughs> if you're in Toronto, you know, there's unexpected things outside your window. Um, but nonetheless, I hope everyone's having a lovely afternoon. For those that have joined us before, welcome back. Uh, for those that it is your first time joining us, um, welcome and thank you for being with us today. My name is Cassandra Francis and I am the founder as well as the um, CEO, clinic director, and one of the psychotherapists at the practice as well. And today we have Rachel Fernandez, who is one of our associate psychotherapists, um, who will be speaking with you about pausing the perfectionist. So I know a lot of people use this word colloquially, therapeutically, randomly, <laughs> you know, talking <laughs> about perfectionism. So I know there'll be a lot of engagement today. Uh, please feel free to use the chat for those that are live. Um, and those that are watching the recorded version, please feel free to use the comment section and we will respond there as well. Thank you and I'll leave it to you, Rachel. Okay, well, hi everybody. Um, like Cassandra said, I'm, I'm a therapist at uh, One Piece. And in terms of this title itself, I think, as, as Cassandra said, it is a little bit of a colloquial term. And the reason I chose pausing the perfectionist, um, it's because sometimes the perfectionistic tendencies can be almost subconscious. And sometimes we need an intentional pause to bring it to the surface. Okay. All right. So, in, in terms of a little bit about me, um, so some of the modalities I pull from include narrative, cognitive, behavioral therapies with some multicultural and creative lenses as well. Some of the focus areas I work with include anxiety, perfectionism, people pleasing, trauma, esteem, identity, stress, or burnout. Great. So today's agenda looks uh, something like this. We're first going to start with defining perfectionism and consider possible causes and common behaviors and counterparts. Uh, the second part is considering negative thinking traps or uh, cognitive distortions related to perfectionistic thinking and considering related to the thought and belief process. Um, after that, we're going to consider some potential adaptive thinking processes and briefly consider some therapy techniques that are typically used and pulled from in the therapy room. And in the end, we'll kind of end off with some reflective questions and briefly consider um, the perfectionist identity slash story. <laughs> All right, so let's start with defining the word perfectionism. Perfectionism involves striving for success and being critical of mistakes. Uh, this approach to success creates unrealistic or extreme expectations, goals, or standards. And at the same time, the fear of failure, the fear of losing control, or the fear of making mistakes can emerge as well. In other words, it's holding two contradictory beliefs. One belief is wanting to meet impossible standards, whether it be being per a perfect worker, a parent, or a child, while also holding the belief that efforts would not be enough. Perfectionism has two definitions. On one end, an individual is trying to uphold an ideal or a standard without faults or mistakes. And on the other hand, it's self-judgment, self-criticism regarding performance, and be at the expense of the self. Okay, so um, Gate and colleagues, they did a study considering the difference between highlighting similar and distinctive features of perfectionism. There's two types, so perfectionistic striving, which is more goal-oriented, and the perfectionist concern, which is more related to a negative self-appraisal, where without moderation, the second can cause adverse outcomes. If this belief system relating to 
uh, perfectionism that's more maladaptive is unchallenged, there may be impacts on self-worth and esteem, where cynicism, uh, negative self-talk or appraisal, regrets, depressive symptoms, discomfort with self, and self-criticism may be potential outcomes. Yeah. So I have a quick question for you, Rachel. Yeah. Um, just for clarification, when it comes to your first point of unrealistic or extreme expectations, goals or standards, are we talking about the individual, right? The subjective expectations that make it unrealistic or is it the objective of what someone can retain or obtain in a period of time, for example? Yeah, it could definitely be both. And it's usually both at the same time, which makes it even more extreme and intense. It's about reaching both internalized expectations, but also interacting with an environment that sometimes feel like it's too pressurized. Thank you. Okay, so this slide is more about some studies that are relevant to perfectionism specifically within the developmental process. Um, so the first study by Malero and uh, company talks about and kind of considers the preteen age, considering the role of age, gender, and different forms of per perfectionism and different intensities as well. So in, in terms of their study, they use three ways of assessing perfectionism. So uh, like we were discussing, more self-oriented, versus other oriented or societal or social oriented. So they highlighted that the con connection of more intense perfectionism uh, was, high, was related to higher mental health concerns like emotional, social, or behavioral concerns. And perfectionistic behaviors emerge from things like social comparison and the environment itself resulting in self-criticism. Uh, the second study focus more on that critical age between 18 and 23, <laughs> the young adult, where university is the context that gives academic stress and that strive for success and the mediating role of uh, increased rumination and worry related to things like the emergence of anxiety and depression, where the perfectionistic side amplified the, the concept of rumination and, and worry. And they saw that students with high perfectionistic tendencies had a tendency to self-isolate and judge themselves based on performance, which exhibits more high perfectionism and have more difficulty coping with things like academic stress, where negative thinking and negative self-appraisals, so negative reflections and rumination, caused other concerns like depression or anxiety to emerge. Essentially, in both of these studies relating to children from a young age of, of like 12 or 13 to even 18 to 23, highlights how in perfectionism, it can result from both external and internal standards where it can be very relevant, specifically in those developmental years. Thereby, when we consider the perfectionistic tendencies and become a little bit more aware of them in the youth and kind of build a way to, to bring about more awareness and preventative action, we can reduce the prevalence and emergence of other mental health concerns that come and surface maybe later in life. Okay, so this slide just kind of introduces how perfectionism has multiple parts. Essentially, there's causes, common behaviors, and counterparts that are related to the idea of perfectionism. Just like in those developmental studies, uh, perfectionism can come up from high internalized standards. Identifying potential causes or behaviors can help bring awareness to unconscious perfectionistic tendencies. Also considering the relationship between perfectionism and other mental health concerns can help cultivate a roadmap toward adaptive approaches, like challenging maladaptive perfectionistic cycles that we'll kind of step into later on in this presentation. Okay, so the causes for perfectionism. So there's 
mainly two forms of how it could come up, uh, specifically in early attachment. So what that means, it's it's kind of basing off that first primary foundational relationship between parent and child. So when that is disrupted or disorganized, it can lead to different factors. So when we're looking at specifically that relationship with perfectionism, it can come with when a parent is absent or highly pressured uh, towards their child, where the child may come up with this understanding based on uh, feedback from the parent that they need to perform or succeed in obtaining attention or approval. Alternatively, when a parent might be uh, only present when the child is successful or if they criticize mistakes, these kind of form non-secure attachments, which can result in the child developing insecure or disorganized attachments to things like performance or errors. However, when there's a more safer and secure space between parent and child, the child can learn to build realistic expectations and grow to regulate discomfort with errors. The other kind of uh, process or projection that perfectionism might come up in is coming from the theory of self-actualization. Essentially, when the pursuit of excellence develops into a need to succeed and achieve regardless of any cost. So that's when the pursuit of some sort of dream or goal becomes the individual's only drive, where tunnel vision to the end goal reduces contact with other elements or relationships of one's experience. So an example of that is imagine Alice desperately wants to be a musician. The pursuit for a perfect song or album takes over her world where she neglects friendships, relationships, and her own personal wellness, where her self-worth suddenly gets more attached to uh, the number of Spotify listens that she receives instead of the pursuit of making music. The two second features uh, called Frost Multidimensional Perfectionism Scale and the Hewitt and Flett Multidimensional Perfectional Scale are assessments that help kind of assess whether perfectionism is maladaptive or adaptive. Okay, so I think we can go to the next slide. I actually have a question. Yeah. So you're talking about the foundation of what can, you know, I guess create perfectionism, right? Mm -hmm. However, is it also common that someone can develop this because due to, let's say, a work environment, so maybe in a young adulthood or adulthood, they develop this sense of perfectionism because of the external pressures, or is it something you would typically see it starts from the home and childhood and therefore shows up later? Yeah, it could definitely be both. So in the sense of the early attachment, that might be, again, more foundational when the parents, the first kind of uh, relationship becomes one of pressure and criticism, and that can trickle into work and adult relationships. Um, but the example that you said about uh, workplace stress and workplace achievement, that could relate to the other theory of trying to achieve self-actualization, but the pressure can, can be almost self-defeating when there's something external, giving that internalized pressure, like a, an added sense of uh, tension and pressure to succeed. So it could be both, it could be either or. It's typically kind of a combination of how individuals relate to expectations. Right, okay, thank you, Rachel. And you also mentioned the words adaptive and maladaptive, right? Do you mind elaborating more on that on viewers and not necessarily the definition, but even when, when is perfectionism seen as adaptive and when is it seen as maladaptive? Yeah, so we, we will touch on that later on. Yeah, <laughs> but in, in summary, uh, maladaptive is 
is almost like it's restrictive or a negative form of appraisal that influences um, action and it kind of integrates into negative self-beliefs while adaptive uses a similar process but it's more realistic and helpful so the belief kind of allows for um, realistic expectations also um, more of a healthier esteem and sense of self-belief to form but yeah we'll, we'll talk more about it later on in the presentation okay good segue good segue <laughs> okay <laughs> All right, so these assessments um, kind of dive deeper into different factors influencing perfectionism. And again, kind of relating to how some can be um, intensified and go into the maladaptive space, while others can be more regulated and become adaptive features of perfectionism. All right, so the first assessment by Hewitt and, and Flett kind of breaks it down into three parts. Um, so the first one is self-oriented perfectionism, where the motivation is a drive for success and a fear of failure. And the goal is trying to accomplish perfection in some way. Um, so it involves negative self-appraisals when unable to meet unrealistic expectations. So an example of that is um, a statement like, I need to be a professional athlete if I don't and worth it. Other oriented perfectionism is motivi motivated by high standards by uh, for close loved ones to achieve perfection. So it's kind of projecting perfection to other people that are close to you. So an example of that is if my son does not win the basketball game, he's a failure. The third type is socially prescribed perfectionism. The motivation is being perfect for others. So needing to be celebrated by others and people that you care about. An example of that is if I score so many baskets in my, uh, my coach and my teammates will think I'm the best. So with each of these kind of um, uh, types of perfectionism, it's, it's somehow working with a standard that influences the way one thinks about themselves or others. All right, on the flip side, uh, the one by Frost brings about six types of related factors to perfectionism. So the first being concern over mistakes, personal standards, doubts about actions, parental expectations, parental criticism, and organization. So this more relates to that idea of early attachment and how it can be increased or created into adaptive places for perfectionism. So what makes it more adaptive? What kind of features can lead to adaptive perfectionism are things like organization and parental expectations when they're more moderated and not extreme. So an example of parental expectations when they're more adaptive is when a child feels like the mom wants them to do well, but it's more of a motivation, less of a standard. It's where it's not related to worth and how much that parent loves them. And on the flip side, when these factors become more extreme or intense, it becomes more maladaptive. Like specifically with things like concern over mistakes, which essentially means letting go of concern for yourself to achieve avoiding mistakes, uh, doubts about action, which is more related to decision making, and parental criticism. So those are kind of environmental factors, relational factors that can lead to neglecting personal needs or values to meet a standard and can lead to poor decision making or feeling stuck, self-judgment, or a need, to, a need to prove oneself, and a negative self-concept, which involves negative self-beliefs. So I have a question. When it comes to Hewitt and Flett's multidimensional perfectionism scale, right? And they're talking about um, socially prescribed perfectionism. So I'm curious with that example of, okay, I want to do this. So 
whoever can think highly of me, right? Mm -hmm. What would you say is the difference between perfectionism tendencies and maybe narcissistic? Oh, that's a really interesting one. Oh, wow. Okay, I like that question. Okay, so in, in terms of perfectionism and narcissism, I think the the more perfectionism is more related to to achieving something, to working towards something, and it can get into a negative headspace that leads to a more negative self-concept, while narcissism might not lead to a negative self-concept. It might actually thrive a level of grandiosity. Right. which can can be harmful to other people where perfectionism might be more self-inflicted right yes yes interesting that makes yeah that makes that's sense. Interesting too. <laughs> thank you no problem all right so kind of switching gears here perfectionism can come up in various anxiety or um, related behaviors where there's extremes or intensified reactions when things are uh, when you're trying to be uh, more perfectionistic so some of those examples include extreme organization extreme cleanliness self-consciousness in both dressing style appearance fitness uh, intelligence all those kinds of parts of self uh, hyper health consciousness procrastination on on um, even studying or even um, meeting some sort of uh, appraisal for work, it, it can have a lot of different um, levels of avoidance of procrastination, uh, reassurance seeking. So this is when um, perfectionists can lead into wanting um, approval, but in a very fast and um, immediate kind of way, checking, and reduction in creativity. I think this one's a really interesting one because creatives and perfectionists can be one and the same sometimes. So it can be a little bit challenging to get started because there's a perfectionistic voice being like, no, it has to be perfect. I have to get the best product or project out. So handling that perfectionist side can also lead to more creativity. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is the this is a few more. So there's difficulty with decision making, slowness in in the way you present oneself. So that is uh, kind of like when you're overthinking a lot, and you want to say the perfect thing, but it's really hard to say the perfect thing. So there's a slowness in speech or even writing. Um, easily surrendering. That's when when you want to kind of give up when things are tough and there's too much perfectionism happening and overloading is a really interesting one it's when it's hard to know when to stop uh, whether it be in an argument whether it be pursuing uh, some sort of goal it's when you don't exactly know when you are reaching your capacity uh, a couple more include hoarding tunnel vision and general avoidance and it's interesting with these different examples you're mentioning because I see, I see in some ways that we can call these symptoms of how one can kind of go through the inventory of, of what they're experiencing. But at the same, not the same side, but on the other end of it, I also see how these are also coping mechanisms, right? Nice. So I, I wonder how you would differentiate the two right like when is it coping when is it a symptom right i think that that kind of coincides with the idea of extremism so if organization helps uh focus when you're doing it doing like a general list and projection of a project that that would be more of a coping or healthy strategy but when it becomes too many to-do lists too many forms of organization like multiple calendars that might be leading to more of a symptom. Okay, thank you. Problem. All right, so uh, going into more of how this can show up in, in mental health concerns, perfectionism can be related to things like OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is more related to those checking behaviors um, and 
obsessive compulsive personality disorder is more related to the criticism part of perfectionism, uh, where it becomes a feature of one's personality and it's hard to distinguish between self and perfectionistic part. Uh, depression, this is when perfectionism leads into negative thinking of oneself. So it slips into a negative self appraisal and uh, almost uh, needing worth to be attached to the standard. And when that doesn't happen, it, it kind of cycles into this negative thought cycle that increases that low mood and the cycle continues and can lead into intense, intense depression, intense low mood. And on the flip side, anxiety is, is almost that the, the energy of those, those behaviors like over checking or hoarding or, um, or trying to organize a lot. It's that fast behavior of needing to control the situation, but it can get away from you when the perfectionism is taking over things like decision making. And this is kind of coinciding with burnout when you're trying to be successful and chase that dream and not exactly taking care of your own needs, burnout can result. And uh, another element is people pleasing. I like to say with my clients when uh, perfectionism shows up, people pleasing might be its partner. So people pleasing is related more to having a standard of self in relationships, so trying to be um, the best friend and compromising what you actually want to do. Um, so it, it coincides with, with the idea of perfectionism because there's a standard or expectation at play. I completely agree with you. People pleasing really does go hand in hand with perfectionism, um, which ultimately can lead to burnout which can either then lead to anxiety or, or depression or sometimes both. Um, but it is the, the, the expectation part that's constantly on people's mind, whether it's of themselves or whether it's of others, whether the goal is to maintain the relationship or even maintain their reputation of, right. of how they feel people see them. Like it, it's the constant um, overcompensation of maintaining that image that ultimately can create burnout or anxiety or depression. Um, I am curious, I'm not sure if you'll be talking about it, but even okay. providing um, an example, you know, for our viewers, let's say they are to see you to talk about their people pleasing perfectionism tendencies. What is a way that you can support someone through that? Yeah, so um, I do touch on a little bit of it um, in terms of therapy techniques that I borrow from. Um, but I usually typically um, engage with more CBT work, which is considering thoughts and uh, beliefs around uh, the identity of a people pleaser or a perfectionist. Um, but on the flip side, I lean into things like parts work, considering if this part called perfectionism is protecting or restricting. Um, so yeah, it really depends on where the client's um, interest is and if the language of thoughts and feelings, or sorry, thoughts and beliefs is more helpful or if parts or emotions or identity is more helpful. So I, I try to gauge what feels more relevant. Yeah, absolutely. That that makes sense. Of course, with no concrete example, it's hard to to land on which direction to go into. Um, but it's interesting when I support clients when it comes to perfectionism, I've learned that it tends to be about identity. Mm -hmm. I think that tends to be at core what we're talking about. It's not just the symptoms. It's not just the coping. It is the belief system and our belief they, it, it encompasses who we are and that deeper work about it. Um, but thank you, Rachel. Yeah, no problem. Uh, all right, so the next kind of consideration is about that thought process. Um, so a fancy term relating to negative th thinking is cognitive distortions. Um, so there's a couple of types of thoughts that might be relevant to perfectionism. Uh, the first being shoulds, uh, should statements. Essentially, 
an example I provided is I should not make any mistakes. I should be better, louder, fitter, smarter. It's almost like a comparative statement. Uh, the second one is all or nothing thinking. It's, it's either giving everything or giving up and doing nothing. So an example of that is if I don't do well in today's meeting, I will never get a promotion or I never give it, um, I need to give it all my, my all or it won't matter. Uh, the third thing is catastrophizing. So this is kind of predicting uh, the most negative outcome. An example of this is if they make fun of me, I won't be able to survive it. And the fourth one is overestimation or underestimation. So it's underestimating your own skill or value and overestimating the environment. So an example of this is if I don't do well, I'm going to be fired. If even though I'm prepared, I'm still going to do bad. So it's contradictory because feelings and the beliefs are not exactly aligned. Uh, the last one here is hyper focus on details. I think this is a really uh, interesting one for perfectionists because it, we can get caught up in that idea of needing to have a perfect approach to all the the details of something that feels big, like a project assignment, uh, whatever it might be. An example of this, if I get all the things done on my to-do list, I'll be good. So looking for that reassurance and things that are tangible. Great. All right, so how do these cognitive distortions become disorders or means of self-appraisal or self-criticism? Uh, these cognitive distor distortions can build into thought patterns informing our actions and how we react to others. These exchanges uh, in conversations or um, in, in environments can reinforce with the feedback we've been uh, given in that exchange. So we're, we're either maladaptive or adaptive cycles form our beliefs, self-beliefs and worldviews. I think this is where the identity piece comes, where it's considering what the, the worldview or the belief is and seeing if it's adaptive or maladaptive. Okay, so here's a, an example of what a thought and belief process can look like in, the, in a perfectionistic mind. Uh, this is a thought cycle that can be related to a student. So a thought, um, could be, I need to be the best student. If not, I'm a failure. So this is a example of all or nothing thinking or that cognitive distortion from the previous slide. And then the related action is the student studies for many hours, makes many lists, but it's hard to prioritize which is, which task is more important. And if they fall into procrastination and gives up on other interests like going to the gym or meeting with friends. And those are examples of those common behaviors that we talked about. So tunnel vision, overloading, procrastination, avoidance, and hyper-organization. And that leads to that uh, servicing of a maladaptive belief where perfection equals success or success equals worth, where the fear of failure or self-criticism can emerge. And then this may reinforce self-belief when the mark or some sort of grade is not fully achieved. And the, the student might ask themselves, why didn't I have the best mark? I'm such a failure. This criticism leads to a reinforced cycle where thought and belief processes colors the individual's view on their self and the expectation and others causing the standard to intensify and increase. And then the cycle repeats where that can lead to the potential consequence of anxiety, depression, burnout, or worse relating to success. So I'm not sure if you will be getting into this, but just to ask, in this example, at what part would you say an intervention would need to occur to break the cycle? Is it at the beginning of thought? Is it before action, after action? And where would you say the change needs to happen. Yeah, there's so there's different approaches. Um, 
in, in terms of interrupting the cycle, it would potentially be in the thought space, kind of unpacking, okay, what does that thought bring? bring? Is it helpful? Um, but even challenging the belief might need um, experimentation, which we'll talk more about in later slides. But yeah, if you were to challenge any of these parts of the cycle, the cycle might change and can lead to different outcomes. Okay, and I think that's a very helpful perspective of, of knowing it's not too late, because I know sometimes, especially when clients are in their journey of healing um, and unlearning, it's, it's, they, they're like, well, I still have the thought, I still think this way, I'm still critical of myself. And it is a normalization that as you are changing, you know, what has become the default, because more often than not being a perfectionist, whether from childhood or adulthood, it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important that, you know, you can have the thought, but it's what you do with that, that can change it, right? Or before even, responding to it um, behaviorally, you change how you're thinking, even though the thought was still present. Um, so thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, in terms of how perfectionism can be challenged or um, kind of made more adaptive by just bringing in an awareness to how it can form. And as you said, it takes, it took a long time to get that identity or, or part of experience. So it also takes some intentionality and practice to challenge it. So it, it does take time, it does take some self-compassion to challenge those um, patterns of thinking. Okay, so, oh, did I do this one? Okay, in, in terms of the next kind of section, it's, it's talking about that maladaptive and adaptive uh, approach to thinking patterns. Okay, so as we kind of discussed, the maladaptive part is uh, leading into rumination or negative self-worth and over-identifying with expectations or standards. So as discussed, this maladaptive thought cycle can be challenged, but it's not about uh, letting go of uh, an expectation or a standard, it's more creating a healthy relationship to it. Um, so the opposite of perfectionism is not uh, dejection, uh, not letting go of those goals. It's more about creating a healthy relationship to mistakes and success, where mistakes are more like learning opportunities and success is just a part of the journey and the journey is meaningful. Yes. Okay. So to kind of dive deeper into what the perfectionist identity is, um, it can be helpful to, to kind of do a preliminary search of what perfectionist means. So this TED Talk is a good example because it, it kind of dives deeper into uh, the perfectionistic uh, identity. And something really helpful about that talk was the idea of imperfect action. Um, essentially, when you're working towards some sort of goal, it can be hard to even start because the, the end goal seems really important. So uh, for an example, if you were to go, uh, if you had this fitness goal of having abs, let's say, <laughs> um, and you go to the gym and it's not as effective because it's just that one time. And then there's a lot of self-criticism that happens after that. So going to the gym uh, the second time might be harder. So the idea here from this tech talk is creating imperfect action, where instead of focusing or hyper-focusing rather on the end goal of achieving that, that um, standard of, of fitness is more about making small scale actions to to achieve smaller scale standards before reaching that ultimate goal so the idea of imperfect action is to to start doing something instead of um, restricting oneself with that end goal all right so 
I think this leans well into what we, we've been talking about with different approaches to the idea of perfectionism. So with CBT work, it's more about thought and action or uh, beliefs and behaviors. So on the one side with thought, you consider bringing more awareness to what feels activating. So what is bringing this side of perfectionism out? Uh, what kinds of thoughts, what kinds of emotions or physical feelings? So this is more of an emotionally focused edition. Um, and then considering what rules are at play with the perfectionistic uh, part, what beliefs um, are involved. And then the, the more uh, challenging part is challenging the, the negative self-belief that has been established by creating adaptive self-beliefs. So an example of that is, um, let's say there's uh, a student. I think the student example is pretty helpful. Um, if they're working towards getting some sort of profession out of it, it's more about considering their identity of a learner or a student instead of being like, oh, I need to be successful. So it's challenging that belief as a way to approach success in a different way. And on the other side is with action. So it's identifying, testing the belief, but using experimentation as a way to uh, challenge that negative or maladaptive belief. And then going back to it and being um, evaluating and drawing up conclusions to see if the experiment was helpful. Uh, these kind of approaches are uh, more, uh, more for more uh, needing of a third party support sometimes and that's okay sometimes it needs more um support to to kind of consider what your alternative belief is uh, what experiments might work what feels possible or approachable so it can feel intimidating with a list like this like oh no now i have to <laughs> figure out what the event is or what my rules are but it takes um uh, not only self-intention, but also sometimes collaboration on what can be approached. Yes, and quite directly, you know, if anyone wants psychotherapy support of, of working through the perfectionist part of themselves, please feel free to reach out to One Piece Therapy, particularly to talk with Rachel on how to get through that because, you know, of course, when we're talking about, um, again, something that we have become identified with or something that, you know, yeah, we're identifying with, it's challenging to release that habit, right? We are creatures of habits. So even though you can want to change certain things, it'll be hard to see what needs to change or know how. So it's it's so fair to just need additional support with that. Um, and I did see a question come in as well. Um, someone asks, can you explain something more about what experimenting means in oh, practice? Yeah. yeah, so with an alternative thought process, what does that mean in practice and what do the rules mean? Oh, okay. So the experiment is more about um, finding some some sort of uh, space or event where you can um, challenge that belief. So whether it be work or school or whatever uh, space it is, considering if your approach uh, relating to that perfectionism is is helpful or not, and using different strategies. So whether it be uh, I think we need like a concrete example. So let's say you're uh, trying to prepare for uh, a meeting where you need to um, present an idea that your managers are gonna evaluate on. So the initial belief might be like, oh no, I have to get it done, but I'm really procrastinating because I need to get it done, but there's a lot of perfectionistic pieces at play. The experiment would be finding um, a way to l make the uh, meeting less of a stressor. So instead of going into that rule of like, okay, I need to achieve in some way, or that belief of needing success, it's more about, okay, what is an alternative belief or rule that can help me get through this presentation and can also foster more of a healthier relationship to 
the, the meeting or, or the presentation. Okay. okay, so these are other techniques that are involved in the therapy space. So something I uh, appreciate about zooming out is using the idea of perspective. So especially when you're uh, hyper-focused on, on a task, on assignment, et cetera, it can feel like there's no other option, no other activity, no other value that seems important. So working on zooming out and considering the impact of this event can help bring the stress down. Similarly, if you were to consider perspective taking, I think this is an interesting example that I share with clients, where if you were receiving text messages of your inner dialogue, the ones of self-criticism or, or self-doubt, and if that was a friend who was saying that, would you still be friends with them? Would you still interact with that person? So considering if if those negative thoughts are helpful or hurtful, can be a way to dismantle that belief. Uh, the third thing is building tolerance. So this might be a little bit more uncomfortable. It might take some more intentionality and practice, but allowing yourself to feel uncomfortable with that presentation or meeting can build a sense of, of tolerance. And to help with that, it can be leading into grounding tools, coping tools, uh, where you are interacting with the anxiety, not trying to dismiss it, but more accept it and let it move through you. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing is rewarding. I think this can be pretty challenging when you're a perfectionist um, because it's hard to to pause and celebrate yourself. You're you're more inclined to be like, okay, what's the next thing? What do I have to prepare for? Not kind of pausing and allowing yourself to be like, okay, I actually did pretty well in that situation. So having um, some awareness about this approach can help um, dismantle that perfectionistic control over uh, how you see yourself. Um, the perfectionism diary can be helpful for clients that lean into journaling or, or, uh, or writing as a coping tool. Essentially, it's a way to highlight for yourself when perfectionistic tendencies are coming into play. So marking down activating events, triggers, et cetera, and considering how intense they are in relationship to each other. So an example of that would be um, uh, a final, final exam might be more intense versus um, an assignment. Uh, using numbers to help with that. So if an assignment is like a, at a level 10 out of 10, or sorry, the, the final exam is at a 10 out of 10, the assignment might be a three out of 10. So kind of allowing yourself to be more observant of the differences of how perfectionistic tendencies can relate to things like anxiety. Okay, um, all right, so the, the, the second last one of reevaluating and realistic standards this might be a tricky one. Uh, this is more about uh, reconsidering your approach to your thoughts and those standards themselves. Are those standards or expectations um, hard to achieve? Are they forms of perfection? Asking yourself if those are, are helpful or are they restrictive in some way? Uh, and then the last one is prioritization. I think this is more of a practical approach to perfectionism where you're using things like to-do lists that might feel familiar, but allowing it to be a, a space to, to build a hierarchy of importance related to tasks instead of saying, okay, everything's important. Okay, so leaving off with this existential thought, I think this is a important piece regarding the perfectionistic part. Um, and in terms of considering what we did today, we, we talked more about the thoughts and the beliefs part of the perfectionistic identity. But as, as we were talking about earlier, uh, Cassandra, 
there are other factors at play like relational, emotional, identity, cultural, societal. So considering those parts are also important to see if they're uh, an influencing factor on how the, we think about ourselves or other people. And um, these questions can help uh, bring about some more reflection if that perfectionistic identity is being uh, helpful in an adaptive way, allowing you to reach those goals, or if it's being maladaptive, restricting you from uh, even trying to do a small version of that goal. Yes, I think it's so important to ask these questions as well, even with motivation. I know sometimes when clients come into therapy and, you know, they're ready for change, which is why they're in therapy. It's also, of course, it's, it's challenging to change what you've become familiar with. Right. So I've often heard the, the fear being expressed about, well, if I don't have my perfectionism tendencies, then I'm not going to feel ambitious. I'm not going to achieve my goals because this has helped me, you know, get through these challenging times. Um, and although that is true, right, that that's why it existed for as long as you've been familiar with it, it, it is that question of what is your motivation? Right? Mm -hmm. What else is there for you to pull from that can have more of the adaptive, a quality to it than your stress because the perfectionism is leading your ambition. Um, so that's a great question. Right. Yeah. It, it reminds me of this quote um, by Brene Brown. She's a social worker and a professor. Uh, the quote is perfectionism is not the same as striving to be our best. Perfectionism is about uh, healthy achievement and is not about healthy achievement and growth. It's a shield. So that idea of how perfectionism can be um, protecting or restricting you from your sense of success is an important consideration to be like, okay, is this part of me helpful or is it is it restricting me from doing what I actually want to do? Is this disconnecting me from the things I value or care about? Right, right. Having those real conversations, those, those yeah. restrictive conversations about yourself with yourself, for sure. All right, so to sum up, um, we went through some considerations of how perfectionism can lead into internalized negative expectations or extreme standards. Uh, and we went through the thought and um, emotion behavior cycle. In, in terms of finding uh, triggers or facilitating adaptive spaces, it's recognizing there's a capacity to challenge um, those beliefs that feel uh, restrictive. And it's, it's also OK to lean on um, third party supports to, to dive deeper into these different elements, because it can be tricky to, to figure out if things like perfectionism or even anxiety or people pleasing, if they're um, contributing to a negative self-concept or mental health concerns. And it's it's helpful to talk more about and reflect on what feels like it might be restriction for you. And the last part is kind of like a end thought about how perfectionism can, can develop into identity and build what we call your story. So considering your story outside of perfectionism might be helpful to see if perfectionism is taking up most, most of how you see yourself. Okay, I think uh, that was about it. <laughs> All right, so any questions? While people might be thinking, if they have any questions. Um, I definitely want to say thank you, Rachel, for presenting on perfectionism and the different parts of just how someone can reconsider who they are. 
right? Or even reconsider who they want to be and the different ways that they can go about to approach it. I think it's so important as much as the term is used colloquially, it is a real concern um, that people do experience. So again, as you said, you know, those that feel you need additional third party support, whether it be psychotherapy, whether um, it be even friends, right? Mm -hmm. um, really taking that time to think about how the different parts of you are working for you versus against you. Um, so thank you so much. We do have questions coming in actually, one second. Um, so yeah, someone said it was so informative and they thanked you for this. Um, and someone else also mentioned, um, can you quickly show the slide where the steps were mentioned, event, thought, sensations, et cetera? Okay. Okay. Let me see. First, let me show the references, right? Just so okay. we can <laughs> acknowledge if anyone wants to further read into this, then here are some references. Um, but also the slide, let me see. Was it this one? Oh, I think they're talking about the cycle. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. What does creating adaptive self beliefs mean? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It was this one. Yeah. So uh, creating adaptive self beliefs is um, creating more of a realistic relationship to the standard. So, if if we were to use an example, it'd be more like um, uh, instead of considering. Um, your worth based on success or um, achievement, that, that would be more of a maladaptive belief. And an adaptive belief would be um, working to, to kind of believe that learning or uh, the journey itself is more of the reward instead of the, the success itself. So it's becoming more adaptive with the process um, instead of being restricted by the outcome. Yeah. Hope that's helpful. I, I do have another cycle, but I don't know if I was able to share it on the presentation, but that's okay. Yeah, that is definitely okay. Um, the okay. person said thank you, so I think you answered their question. Okay. Um, but again, if anyone does want to reach out to um, Rachel, please feel free to contact One Piece Therapy. Um, our information will be provided in an email for those that are watching live and those that are watching the recorded version. Um, it will be in the description box so you can access us um, and talk more about identity and perfectionism. Any last questions before we check out for today? Okay, okay. So a participant mentioned they would like to hear more examples. Um, I think that is a great opportunity. Maybe we can reach out to you directly to, to continue the conversation with uh, Rachel. I hope that's okay. Maybe you don't have to say okay. In the chat. Okay. 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 No problem. Um, okay. So I guess we, you were checked the press. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. If you do have any questions, even when you watch the recorded version, um, please feel free to use our um, the comment section and on YouTube, and we can also respond to your inquiries there. Uh, but again, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, those that have attended today. Thank you, those that are watching the recorded version. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. All right, thank you, everyone.